For so many of us, celebrities hold an irresistible appeal. We love to follow along with the lives of well-known athletes, movie stars, and even influencers. For our personal favorites, it's tempting to accept the shiny, perfect image the media presents us. We see the glamorous homes, the fancy cars, the smiling couple in the magazine, and we want to believe that it's real. That these people are as bright and shiny and good in real life as they appear to us from afar. But everyone has secrets, and those in the public eye have even more reason to keep theirs well hidden. This case is about the allure of celebrity, its corrupting influence, and the dark secrets that lurk behind even the most perfect facades. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 25 of the Dark Liberty Podcast. I'm your host, Kimberlea, and I'm here with my co-host, new dad, and soon to be my husband, Jonathan. <laughs> Hi. Dark Liberty. It's the dark downward slope into the degradation of the human mind and the consequences that such darkness brings to light. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, hit the notification bell so you don't miss an episode in case we post on a random day, but we've been more consistent lately. I can't believe we're finally on episode 25. We're halfway to 50. Thank you for all your continued support. And just so you know, we're doing two new things. Our podcast is now on all podcasting platforms and and we're also going to do exclusive podcast episodes on Apple and all the other places you listen to audio versions. That's coming soon. And also coming soon is our merch almost about to come out. We promise we're still like testing a few items and whatnot, but we're going to have that to you soon. That will be located at darklivity.com. So if you want to bookmark it or sign up for our exclusive mailing list, don't worry, we're not going to spam you because I can't stand emails, but you will get a 20% off coupon code when you do sign up. I, for one, am excited to show you the designs I've been working on. Yeah, he's been working on a lot and it's hard, but we're having fun doing it and it's all for you. There will be some other updates in the description box, like our coupon code for CrimeCon. If you want to see us every year, be sure to use our code so we can keep coming back and we really want to see all of you there again. So sign up before all of the tickets sell out. Okay, so now into the case for today. And to understand this case, first, we need to understand Melissa James, who she was, where she came from, and the dreams that she had for her life, because Melissa was a dreamer, but not in the abstract, head in the cloud sense. She was actually a real go getter. She wanted to be successful and she wanted to be a famous dancer and choreographer. And she leaped at every opportunity that life presented for her to achieve those goals. Melissa's mom, Maura James, might have put it best when she she said that Melissa was always so sure of who she was and what she wanted. Melissa Ann James was born on March 23rd, 1977 to her mother, Maura James. Maura raised Melissa as a single mom, along with her brother and sister in Panama City, Florida. Melissa had a very happy childhood growing up in the sunny beach town. Starting at age seven, when she took her first dance class, Melissa fell in love with dancing, and that's when she knew what she wanted to do with her life. She especially loved jazz and ballet. In high school, Melissa pursued cheerleading, which gave her the opportunity to dance and choreograph for her school. I did cheerleading as well. And by the way, I was really excited to read all of your comments from our last video telling me what you did in high school. We kind of already went through this last time, but I loved gymnastics. I could tumble. So I always ended up on the cheerleading squad for that reason, because I was tiny, so I was a good flyer as well. What about you? Did you do sports? I forget. I did sports before high school, but in high school, I loved skateboarding. That's what you said last yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, I did. I was really into soccer and baseball before high school. Oh, that's fun. I like soccer too. Mm -hmm. Melissa wasn't just into cheerleading and dance. She was also a bright student, so much so that she graduated one year early in 1994 from Crawford Mosley High School to begin attending junior college. But while studying at Gulf Coast Community College, Melissa realized she wanted to pursue her dream, a career in dance. So Melissa left Gulf Coast to open her own dance studio in 1996. At only 19, Melissa ran her own business. That's pretty impressive at only 19 years old to have like the grit and know what you want to do and open your own studio. 
The dance studio was well known and loved among the local Panama City community. Melissa cared so much for the kids who took her classes, she offered scholarships to underprivileged kids in the community and accommodations to children with special needs. She wanted everyone to be able to access dance. Something else that I'm impressed with and I'm sure her mother was so proud of, not everyone at that age thinks about helping others. Teenagers can be so self-centered, but it just goes to show you that some people are just naturally more inclined to be altruistic. And outside of running her own studio, Melissa spent a lot of her time with her mother and her close friends. She and her mom loved to go shopping, bake together, and make crafts. Melissa's mom described her daughter as friendly, passionate, energetic, and outgoing. She said she was not only a gifted dancer, but a strong leader as well. Melissa's best friend in Panama City echoed those same sentiments, saying Melissa was the type of person who could walk into a room of 20 strangers and leave best friends with 15 of them. Melissa Melissa was beautiful, vibrant, and charming, and her energy for life was contagious. But when her many charms caught the eye of a celebrity in town for a fitness competition, the trajectory of Melissa's life would change forever. Melissa met a guy named Craig Titus by chance in 2001 while working a table at a local Panama City fitness competition. The two clicked instantly. And Samantha, Melissa's best friend, said that weekend was the start of a long friendship between Craig and Melissa. Samantha said Melissa was proud to be friends with Craig. And who wouldn't be? Craig was a famous, muscular, wealthy bodybuilder. And Melissa was so impressed and captivated by his celebrity and his success. Craig was someone who had made his dreams come true in a big way. And we know that Melissa had big dreams as well that she wanted to pursue. So she looked up to Craig for that reason. Craig Titus was born on January 14th, 1960. 65 in Wyandotte, Michigan, which is just outside of Detroit, to parents Michael and Sandra Titus. Craig did not have an easy childhood. He was the oldest of three children, and their father worked an extremely difficult manual labor job as a tunnel digger, the same job Craig's grandfather did before that. Masculine strength was a priority in the family, a necessity for the jobs the Titus men held. But that was a problem for Craig. He was very small. Even in the high school, he tried to join his high school's football team, but he was very scrawny, only about five foot six, so he wasn't big or strong enough to play. Many of Craig's friends said he carried this chip on his shoulder with him for the rest of his life. That memory of being too small, too scrawny, not strong enough fueled him, though, throughout his entire career. When Craig couldn't play football, he fell into wrestling. Wrestling is separated into weight classes, so if you're small, you're wrestling against people your own size. But these weight classes also create an intense focus on the body, on weight, on fat to muscle ratio. This is where Craig's obsession with his own physique began. And although he was small, Craig excelled in wrestling, winning Michigan State's wide wrestling championship for the 132 pound weight class. Also, by the end of high school, Craig had grown another three inches, putting him at five foot nine and 140 pounds. Then, when he began his career as a bodybuilder, his weight skyrocketed. By 21, he was 185 pounds, and a few years later, he hit 242 pounds. Yes, you heard that correctly. At the height of his career, Craig was a whopping 100 pounds heavier than he had been in high school, 100 additional pounds of solid muscle. With that kind of muscle, it's no wonder Craig quickly began to make a name for himself in the bodybuilding community. Early in his career, Craig also got married, fathering twins, a son and and a daughter. But tragically, his son died of SIDS, that sudden infant death syndrome. Yeah, SIDS is something that I am still so terrified having a newborn right now. Back in the 80s and even the 90s, babies were still being put to sleep on their tummies, but things started to change when the Back to Sleep campaign launched in 1994. They began to help educate new parents that putting babies to sleep on their backs was safer. And this helped reduce the number of SIDS cases. But sadly, Craig and his wife divorced soon after their son passed away. And there's almost no mention of Craig's ex-wife or daughter in the media after the divorce. Being a father and a husband wasn't part of the image that Craig was trying to build. He wanted to be the sort of like bad boy of bodybuilding. Right. And this moniker was first attached to him when he threw an epic temper tantrum at a high profile bodybuilding competition. See, Craig had grown used to winning 
And when he earned second place, he smashed the trophy into pieces and stormed off the stage. Wow, that's pretty immature, but also, isn't that what they call like roid rage? Yeah. I mean, I can't know for sure if he was on steroids, but it is a stigma around the bodybuilding industry. Well, regardless of whether it was roid rage or just rage at the time, he definitely did use it. And this reputation as a bad boy was further cemented when Craig was arrested for selling ecstasy. Craig was given probation for this first offense, but he violated it because he was using steroids. So he was sent to prison for 21 months from 1995 to 1997. Rather than ending his career when Craig emerged from prison, his bodybuilding career climbed to a new height. He leaned into this bad boy image. There were so many bodybuilders and having this reputation distinguished him from a marketing standpoint. That's pretty smart. It kind of reminds me of WWE. Is that what it's called? Like all the wrestlers that have their own personas? Exactly. It was a lot like that. And Craig cultivated this bad boy persona, rising to greater and greater fame as he accumulated title after title. He placed in the Mr. Olympia contest, making him one of the best bodybuilders in the entire world. He won the Arnold Schwarzenegger Classic. He was even hired to be a personal trainer to Vince Neil, Motley Crue's lead singer. Just when it seemed his star couldn't rise no further, he coupled with Kelly Ryan, one of the most successful female bodybuilders. And the pair moved to Vegas together, a mecca for bodybuilders, with more fitness competitions than almost anywhere else in the country. So I was actually a personal trainer back in the day, but I was never into bodybuilding. However, John's cousin and her husband yeah. just won a fitness competition and they got, they got so ripped yeah. and they're like in their forties. Crazy. So yeah. I don't have that dedication. I do not, I do not go to the gym. I think you're hot. Well, thank you. Well, throughout this time, Craig had kept in touch with Melissa James, and I don't want us to lose sight of Melissa while we're telling you more about Craig and Kelly, so I wanted to point that out, that she and Craig were still in touch when he and Kelly moved to Vegas. He invited Melissa to actually come with them and work as a couple's live-in personal assistant, and this was back in 2003. Melissa's dance studio had actually just shut down, and her mom had moved to New Jersey. There was nothing really holding Melissa back, and this was a golden opportunity. A chance for her to rub elbows with celebrities, make connections, and live in a city where performance and dance was one of the major industries. Melissa seized the opportunity and didn't look back. This is when Melissa first met the dazzling all-American fitness star, Kelly Ryan. Kelly was born in 1972 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but her family would eventually settle in Greensville, South Carolina. Kelly came from a really good family and she had a happy childhood. Her passion as a young girl was gymnastics and she excelled at it. Even training under Bella Caroli, a gymnastics coach, unfortunately, Kelly's gymnastics career would fall short of qualifying for the Olympics. So Kelly took her skills in dance, choreography, and acrobatics to the University of South Carolina, where she quickly became a leader on the cheerleading team. So of course, she and Melissa had that in common as well as dance. And Kelly loved cheer so much that she hoped to pursue it professionally after school. She dreamed of dancing for the LA Lakers, but a twist of fate set Kelly on on a different path. Just before she graduated, she happened to see a women's fitness competition, but she was entranced by the women's strength and poise and thought her years of gymnastics training might help her stand out in the fitness world. She put her dreams of dancing on hold and began to pursue competitive fitness. And her instincts were right. She skyrocketed to the top of women's fitness. No one could compete with her gymnastic abilities. She was nicknamed Flying Ryan for the way she almost seemed to fly across the stage with her flips. Soon, she won Miss Fitness USA, solidifying her position as the star in women's bodybuilding. Then she won the title six more years in a row. No one could touch her. Of course, this success caught the eye of Craig Titus. Craig first met Kelly in 1995. He tried asking her out, but Kelly heard of his bad reputation and didn't want anything to do with him. Then in 1999, when he got out of prison, Craig tried again. But still, Kelly rebuffed his advances. She wasn't interested in bad boys, especially not ones with criminal records. But Craig was persistent. He brought the same determination to his romantic pursuits as he did his professional ones. The pair kept running into each other and Craig kept trying. He opened up to Kelly about his childhood, showing her his softer side and telling her that the bad boy persona was only something he portrayed in the media. Kelly was charmed by Craig's vulnerability and the pair began to date. Soon after that, in June of 2000, Kelly and Craig got married. 
As a married couple, their star power only multiplied. The two biggest stars of women's and men's bodybuilding were now married. People called them Beauty and the Beast. Craig, the huge muscular bad boy, was of course the Beast. And Kelly, who was thought of as a sweetheart and a Southern belle, was Beauty. The media loved them, the fans loved them, and they were the power couple, and there was nowhere better to cash in on their fame and grow their careers than Las Vegas. At first, Vegas was a dream come true for Kelly, Craig, and even Melissa, everything they had hoped for. Kelly and Craig were racking up promotions, sponsorships, appearances, magazine covers, the money and the opportunities were flowing, and Melissa felt lucky to have a front row seat to all of it. She called her mom and told her about her growing friendship with Kelly Ryan, how exciting it was to be living with such a successful couple. Melissa was hopeful that the couple's success would soon translate into more opportunities for her to advance her own career. But they don't call it Sin City for nothing. Las Vegas may be full of opportunities for entertainers, but it's equally full of temptation. Kelly's close friends said she started to worry about Craig and Kelly that they were embracing Las Vegas a little too much. And Samantha, Melissa's friend, also began to worry about the influence Vegas, Craig, and Kelly were having on Melissa. It's true. The longer Melissa lived with Craig and Kelly, the more she started to see the cracks in their picture-perfect relationship that they presented to the media. For one thing, Kelly was getting older. And in the late 90s and early 2000s, Kelly had come in first in almost every competition she competed in. But as she got older, finally hitting her 30s, the competitions dwindled. And so did her first place finishes. And Craig didn't support his wife through these changes. Rather, he would pile on the pressure. He wanted Kelly to maintain her body and appearance even as the years went by. Friends say he pressured her into plastic surgery, encouraging procedure after procedure so she could look like the young girl she had been when they first met. Now, Kelly's friend said about the couple's dynamic, quote, you see this athlete that's so strong and wonderful, yet when it comes to her marriage, she was the weakest person on the planet. She would just roll over and allow him to do anything he wanted, end quote. Yikes. That's scary and it's concerning. I'd say to any woman, don't let a man pressure you into changing your body. But this was their livelihood and it's the industry that they were in. It was all about looks. Right. In the beginning, Craig had been the one begging Kelly to be with him. But as she aged, the dynamic reversed and Kelly began to do anything she could to keep Craig interested, including conceding to opening their sex life. Oh no. And that would be my other piece of advice to give couples just don't. I mean, some people they're down with like the open door policy, the open relationship, opening their bed to others. But every single person that I've ever talked to has regretted it in in one way or another, especially if they loved their partner, because I haven't heard one positive story in the end, because it's all fun until it's not, until the feelings get involved but to each their own, I guess, as well. Right. One may do as they please. I think if one goes down this road, it probably takes immense honesty and communication that someone will always end up with the shorter stick, right? Well, Craig and Kelly's house became known in Vegas as a hotspot for crazy drug-fueled swinger parties. There were rumors of threesomes, sex tapes, and more during these parties. A fellow bodybuilder said he wasn't surprised when he heard about the parties. He said, we all know Craig. And this begs the question, Was it all Craig? We know Kelly was going under the knife to please him. So was she also agreeing to swinging just to keep Craig in their marriage? I mean, it wouldn't surprise me, sadly, because it's so much more acceptable for men to age gracefully than it is for women. There's such a stigma. I mean, for men, they can have like the salt and pepper hair, the rugged look. They can even have wrinkles and dad bods. And it seems like women look for what's on the inside and forgive the outward appearance. But for women, nope. If they get gray hair or if they have a little flab after like having a baby, it's seen as a bad thing. Like they let themselves go or that they need to bounce back quickly. Definitely a lot more pressure on women, I think, which is unfair since we're the ones whose bodies are truly transforming, especially with childbirth. So I wonder, did Kelly enjoy their open marriage too, or was this all for Craig's benefit? Friends who knew them seemed to think that most of the extramarital sex was fueled by Craig. And they said that Craig didn't confine his affairs to the parties. There were rumors that he was sleeping around and most concerningly that he was actually having an affair with their assistant, Melissa James. Yes. Melissa was beautiful and young. And when the rumors of Craig and Melissa having an affair started to make their rounds, 
it must have been really difficult for Kelly to hear. And Melissa certainly started to feel the awkwardness in their living arrangement because she decided to return to New Jersey and be with her mom. And that's what I was going to say. A lot of these swinging relationships end when one person in the relationship starts seeing someone on the DL alone without their partner. Melissa's mom said upon her daughter's return that she knew something was wrong. She knew Melissa had gotten into drugs while in Vegas and she knew her daughter wasn't perfect. She knew that Vegas lifestyle had changed Melissa, but she hoped that after some time of being home, it would put her daughter back on the right track. However, Melissa barely had time to get her footing in New Jersey before Craig and Kelly called her back to Vegas. In October of 2005, Mara James watched her daughter depart for Las Vegas a second time, and this would be the last time she ever saw Melissa again. That's truly so sad. We never know when the last time with someone will be. I always keep that in mind when I research these cases and I take it with me into my everyday life. When Melissa returned to Vegas, the tension between her and Kelly only worsened. That's not surprising. Craig and Kelly could not come to an agreement about Melissa's compensation. So Craig would give Melissa cash and credit cards and tell her to buy anything she needed, but not tell Kelly. Now this created discomfort and confusion in the house with Kelly often accusing Melissa of stealing and Melissa tried to stick it out. This was the place where her dreams were going to come true. And this was the couple that was going to make it happen. But more and more promises were broken. Craig and Kelly had told Melissa that she could manage their retail store with clothing and fitness products, but the store never opened. Craig and Kelly had promised Melissa opportunities, but all they had brought her was parties, alcohol, and drugs. Melissa spiraled deeper. Finally, on December 13th, 2005, Melissa called her mom and said she was coming home for the holidays. She said that she couldn't stand to be around Craig and Kelly anymore. She said that things have gotten uncomfortable and there was so much drama around the house. She told her mom that Kelly had accused her of stealing and that she just needed some space. She had a return flight to Vegas booked for December 30th, but who knows? If she had gone home, gotten away from the drama, would she have returned? Maybe a two-week detox at home away from Kelly and Craig's toxicity would have been the end of her relationship with the couple. We'll never know because when Mara James drove to Newark Airport to pick up her daughter, Melissa never showed up. Mara waited at baggage claim calling her daughter over and over again, but she never picked up her phone. Mara then called Kelly and Craig repeatedly and they too didn't answer. So Mara went home, terrified that something happened to all three of them. When she still hadn't heard from her daughter the next day, she began to call each hospital in Las Vegas. But this too was a dead end. But finally, she got a call back from Craig. And he said he didn't know anything. He didn't know where Melissa was. But Mara said she knew in that moment that there was something he wasn't telling her. As they say, a mother's intuition is always right. And the next 24 hours would change Mara James' life forever. In the early morning hours of December 14, 2005, a car was reported burning on Sandy Valley Road in Nevada. A trucker called 911 when he saw the flames burning bright against the black night, about a half a mile off the road. Dick Draper, the Mountain Springs fire chief, responded to the call, and as he drove to the burn site, he wasn't overly concerned. He knew that this lonely desert road was a common place for people to dispose of cars that they didn't want. Maybe the cars were stolen or people didn't want to keep making payments on them. Whatever the reason, this wasn't the first flaming car he had to deal with. He made it to the car, noting that the blaze was particularly huge, and it took him over an hour to put it out. Finally, when the flames had subsided, Draper peered inside the burned remains of the vehicle and he said he could tell right away it was a really nice sports car, even though the car was almost completely incinerated. The seat framings were intact, but there was no fabric or dash, just metal remained. But there was something smoking heavily in the back of the car. Draper leaned closer to investigate, and that's when he saw a human arm in the back seat. He called 911. He knew in that moment that this was not a run-of-the-mill abandoned car. They were dealing with something much more serious. Metro police arrived in response to Draper's call and taped off the scene. Police pried open the car's trunk and discovered the charred remains of a human body. The barrier between the back seat and the trunk had partially disintegrated during the burn, explaining the arm that Dick Draper had seen. Oh my god, that's just horrible. Police removed the body and sent it to the coroner's office, hoping the medical examiner could glean something from what remained. Police also recorded footwear and tire tracks at the scene, hoping that it might be useful in tracking down whoever did this. However, at the coroner's office, the medical examiners were faced with a real challenge. 
over 70% of the body was burned, making it almost impossible to determine a cause of death. But they investigated what remained along with the ashes, and it was truly a gruesome autopsy. The body was unfortunately so damaged, they were unable to use traditional methods of facial recognition or fingerprinting to determine an identity. Instead, they named the body Sandy Valley Jane Doe. The body showed signs of a brutal, multifaceted attack. First, there was duct tape. The medical examiner had to remove layers and layers of duct tape that were wrapped tightly around the victim's entire face. Next, there were ligatures around the victim's neck. The medical examiner removed a fabric ligature tied around the neck, affixed with a knot on the left side. Beneath the fabric ligature were further wire ligatures, which also had to be removed from the neck. Then there was evidence that the body had been electrocuted by a taser. And lastly, a toxicology report showed the body contained fatal amounts of morphine. However, despite the heavy burning, examination of the lung tissue showed no evidence of smoke inhalation, meaning that the victim had died before the fire started. But how? Had the victim died of suffocation as a result of the duct tape over her face or strangulation as a result of ligatures around her neck or electrocution as a result of the taser? Or was it an overdose because of the morphine? Or yet some other unknown cause that couldn't be determined because of the severe burning. In the end, the medical examiner had no other choice but to rule the body's cause of death as inconclusive. It was clear the body had suffered severe trauma before and after death. But because of the extent of the burning, they just couldn't tell what in the end had killed the Sandy Valley Jane Doe. I just want to stop for a second and think about this. The fact that there were so many different ways that this poor woman could have died is horrific. It truly speaks to all of the different assaults and indignities her body had to endure. We can't know whether these different attacks happened while she was alive or dead, but the mere idea that someone would do this to one person speaks at best to the callous disregard they had for human life. At worst, a deep and vicious hatred for this victim. It is so heartbreaking to think about all this, that this is someone's child, a friend, someone's family member or loved one. Paints a picture of relentless brutality where her body faced numerous assaults. Whether these horrors were inflicted while she was still alive or after death, they reflect a disturbing level of cruelty and contempt for human dignity. Consider that behind these acts was someone's beloved daughter, friend, family member whose life ended in such a tragic and violent manner. Whoever did this has a deep neglect for compassion and respect for life. The investigators were determined to find out who committed this heinous act. First, they interviewed the trucker who made the 911 call to report the burning car. The trucker had some interesting information. He said two cars sped up and passed him before he saw the blaze. One was a gray truck and the other a red Jaguar. Then minutes later, the gray truck sped back past him, this time going in the opposite direction. A few minutes later, he found the red Jaguar burning. He and the police thought the driver of the gray truck certainly had something to do with the crime. After the blaze cooled, investigators combed through the ashes of the burned car. They found the charred remnants of a suitcase, keys, clothing, part of a barbecue set, a purse, tweezers, and what looked like syringes. And then, most crucially, they found a license plate. The screws that affixed the license plate to the car had melted causing the plate to fall away from the blaze, preserving just enough so the police could run the plate. When they did, they saw the owner of the car was a woman named Kelly Ryan. Police drove to Kelly Ryan's address where the records indicated she lived with her husband, Craig Titus. Police prepared to tell Craig Titus that they might have found the body of his wife burned in the trunk of her car. But Craig Titus didn't open the door when police knocked. Kelly Ryan did. Police were confused. If it wasn't Kelly's body in the back of the car, then whose was it? I'm sure most of you can guess. Kelly Ryan and Craig Titus thought they had an answer. While police were shocked to see Kelly Ryan open the door, Kelly and Craig didn't seem surprised to see them at all. In fact, they said they were about to call the police themselves because a red Jaguar had been stolen and they were pretty sure they knew who took it, their former assistant, Melissa James. Police sat down with Kelly and Craig in their home and asked the couple to tell them more about Melissa. The pair told the investigators a tragic story about the 
the deeply troubled personal assistant. They said Melissa had gone down a bad path once she got to Vegas. They painted a picture of a desperate drug addict. They said Melissa had been a regular user of meth and that she had frequently stolen from them to support her habit. They said they had felt for her and her struggles, but eventually they couldn't put up with her behavior any longer. They told police they had recently fired Melissa, buying her room in a motel for her last night in town and had a plane ticket back to her mom in New Jersey. They said that when Melissa vacated the house, they had found hypodermic needles and a stolen credit card of Kelly's in Melissa's room. But wait a minute. This account automatically raises a couple red flags. For one, remember when Melissa called her mom on December 13th? She said she was coming home from the holidays, but that she had a return flight on December 30th. It was a round trip ticket. So if Kelly and Craig were trying to get rid of Melissa, why would they have bought her a return flight? And furthermore, if Melissa was a thieving drug addict who had been stealing from them for months, why... Would they get her a hotel room and a plane ticket and not just like kick her out or call the police and report all this? Well, to play devil's advocate, they were close. She'd been living with them and they were all friends. Right. And maybe they didn't want to be overly cruel with her and they did their best to cut ties, but not make things even worse for her. Maybe, but investigators felt that there was something about Kelly and Craig's story that just was not adding up. The way they talked about Melissa, it was like the couple seemed to be going out of their way to paint an extremely unflattering picture of her. And I understand, you know, if this person is doing this, if they're stealing from you, if they're causing problems in your life, maybe you would have a pretty bad perspective on them. But the investigators pressed the two bodybuilders for more information, asking them to walk them through their last 24 hours step by step. Kelly and Craig said that the last time they had seen Melissa was the afternoon of December 13th. They said they offered to drive her to the airport, but they claimed that Melissa had requested that they just drop her off at Green Valley Grocery instead. Now, this detail confused officers too, because the Green Valley Grocery was just around the corner from Craig and Kelly's house and very far away from the airport. So why would Melissa have asked them to drop her there? So the feeling that something was off only grew as Kelly and Craig continued their story. Next, they told the investigators that they had friends over, Jeremy and Megan Foley, the night of December 13th. They said the four of them had stayed up late partying, Jeremy and Megan finally leaving around 2 a.m., at which point Craig and Kelly went to sleep. Craig and Kelly said that they thought Melissa had stolen their Jaguar from the garage while they slept. And this confused police too, because could Melissa really have stolen Craig and Kelly's car without them waking up? Kelly said she first noticed the Jaguar was missing around 5.30 that morning when she went into the garage to practice some of her poses for her bodybuilding competitions. She said she didn't report the car missing because she hoped that Melissa would return it soon. But this hope seemed to fly in the face of what Kelly and Craig had just said about Melissa. Why would they expect a known thief who, according to them, had kept Kelly's credit card and never attempted to give it back to return their car? But then came the biggest red flag of all. When Craig was alone with the investigators, he disclosed to them that he had been having an affair with Melissa. He swore his wife didn't know about it, but come on. The three of them were living together. Craig wanted investigators to believe that he'd been having this affair with his assistant in his home right under his wife's nose and that she didn't know. There's just no way. But despite the bombshell of the affair and all the logical inconsistencies in Kelly and Craig's story, the only real evidence the police had was the burned body in the trunk of Kelly's car. And with the couple claiming that the vehicle had been stolen, there was little the police could do at the point to link the blaze or the body to Craig and Kelly. The couple gave police photos of Melissa James and the investigators departed. Sadly, with the photos, investigators were able to make a preliminary identification of the body as belonging to Melissa James. The horrific duct tape bindings around the victim's head had actually helped preserve enough of the facial tissue for investigators to make a reasonably confident identification despite the severe burns. This was Melissa James. Detectives were sure of it. On December 14th, they called Melissa's mother with the awful news. After Maura had spent an entire day repeatedly calling her daughter, calling Craig, Kelly, in every hospital in Vegas, she received the call that no parent should ever have to receive. The call that is every parent's worst nightmare. It makes me tear up so much having a baby right now with all the years that parents devote to their children 
only to get news like this. Maura said that when she heard the news, it felt like she was on the outside looking in on someone else's life. At first, she hoped that maybe the police were wrong, that it wasn't Melissa. And my emotions were really getting to me when I was reading this. And I just, I don't know. To me, that's the worst thing that you could possibly find out. I felt so bad for this mother. She said she knew deep down that it was her daughter. When she heard how her daughter died, she was even more shocked. She said that no one should ever have to die like she did. Then the police asked Maura to submit to DNA testing. They were sure that the body was Melissa's, but with the severe burning, the only way to definitely determine the victim's identity was with DNA testing. Maura provided her DNA for that purpose. Meanwhile, police began to interview Kelly and Craig and all of Melissa's known associates, hoping that one of their friends could shed some light on what happened to Melissa. They asked about Melissa's drug use. Who was her dealer? Had she had a fallen out with them? Did she owe someone money? But time and time again, friends brought up not just Melissa's abuse of drugs, but also Craig's. They said that although he claimed to have turned over a new leaf after his time in prison, he still used steroids, oxy, and sometimes even meth. Friends also mentioned Kelly and Craig's crazy parties. They told officers about how Kelly and Craig used these drug field parties to have sex with other partners and couples. They said that Craig did the same outside of parties too. Several friends also mentioned Craig's affair with Melissa. Although Craig said Kelly didn't know about this affair, their friends seemed to think that Kelly did know and that she only went along with it to please Craig. This new portrait of famed bodybuilders raised officers' suspicions even more. It's one of the oldest stories in the book, Sex, Lies, and Jealousy. It's the stuff at the heart of most crimes. Officers went back to Kelly and Craig's house to ask a couple more questions. Unfortunately, this second interview yielded little useful information. Kelly and Craig stuck to their story. They had fired Melissa, dropped her off at Green Valley Grocer, and hadn't seen her since. However, Craig did mention one interesting new detail in his interview, that Melissa had a boyfriend. He said that Melissa had recently started dating someone, a guy named Brett, who she had met online. That's a red flag for me. With the recent cases I've been doing about women dying or nearly dying from matching with psychos on Tinder, it's a no. Well, when the police called Maura James, she confirmed that yes, Melissa had mentioned a new boyfriend. So police quickly tracked Brett down. But Brett was a dead end. He was devastated to learn of Melissa's death. His grief and surprise felt sincere. Plus, he had a strong alibi. He was confirmed to be out of state at the time of Melissa's death. Although Brett wasn't a suspect, the introduction of a new boyfriend to the story raised some very interesting questions. Had Melissa ended things with Craig for good because she was dating Brett? Clearly, Craig had known about Brett. So was he jealous? The more detectives investigated, the more tangled the web of relationships around Melissa James seemed to be. While the police's second interview with Craig and Kelly provided little information, they weren't done looking into the couple. Next, they decided to check their alibis. If they were indeed home asleep during the time of Melissa James's death, their phone records should support that. However, when police subpoenaed Craig and Kelly's phones, they found something very interesting, something that confirmed at the very least that Craig wasn't asleep the entire night like he said he was. On the night of Melissa's murder, when Craig said he was sleeping, he had made 14 calls to one person, someone named Anthony Gross. Police immediately brought Anthony in for questioning, and soon police learned that Anthony was psychopathic and quite the hanger-on. Okay, I didn't know what that meant. I'd never heard of it before. I'd heard of the stage nine clinger when it came to like relationships or crushes, but hanger on, I had to look that one up. It's a person who associates with another person or group of people for the purpose of gaining some personal advantage, like riding someone's coattails. Exactly. And over the years in Vegas, Kelly and Craig had collected a bit of an entourage, a group of friends and fans who adored the couple. They were the same people who regularly attended Craig and Kelly's parties. Anthony Gross was a member of that group. He was an aspiring bodybuilder and he revered Craig. Would have done anything for him and anything to be like him. Anthony was a ride or die for this couple and clearly Craig knew it. But when the officers put pressure on Anthony in an interrogation, the young man broke down almost immediately. He said Craig had called him in the middle of the night asking him for help. He said he drove his gray pickup truck to meet Craig and Kelly at the gas station. There, Anthony put gas in his tank 
filled up a portable gas can, gave it to the couple, and then followed them down Sandy Valley Road. Then he watched Craig douse the Jaguar in gasoline and lighter fluid and set it on fire. He said Craig jumped into the pickup with Kelly and yelled, go, go, go. Anthony then sped back down Sandy Valley Road, dropping Kelly and Craig off at their house. Oh my God, what the hell? That's insane. Why would anyone help them do that? Anthony was adamant that he only thought he was helping Kelly and Craig dispose of their car. He said he had no idea that there was a body in the trunk. What? I I mean, okay, okay. So that officer did say that people go there to like burn their vehicles. If I was younger and I saw my friends burning a car, I'd be like, yeah, that seems fun. That seems fun. I don't know. To me, that seems very dangerous. But officers thought Anthony might know more than he was letting on. When they checked his truck, they saw that he recently got new tires. It was as though he knew that officers might try to match his tire tracks to the ones at the scene. It seems like a lot of trouble to go through if he truly believes that all he helped his friends do was dispose of their vehicle. Anthony was arrested for accessory to murder and third degree arson. His account of what happened was a huge break in the case. If Anthony was telling the truth, then Melissa had certainly not stolen Kelly and Craig's car. And the famous couple was guilty, at the very least, of arson. But police needed evidence to back up Anthony's statements. And they were also hoping to find proof that the couple had known Melissa James' body was in the trunk when they set the car on fire. So police pulled the video footage from the gas station that Anthony had mentioned. And sure enough, Anthony was in the videos. His gray truck pulled up alongside a red Jaguar. However, the driver of the red Jaguar did not exit the car in this video, and the windows were too dark to see who was driving it. But police were still hopeful. They checked Craig and Kelly's credit cards to see if there were any transactions from the gas station, and there were no charges on either Craig or Kelly's cards. But there was one charge at 3.31 a.m., at a Walmart across the street. Another Walmart. I am definitely making that shirt that Mm -hmm. says there's always a Walmart. And then it's going to say like in little, like, if you know, you know, Mm -hmm. and it'll be an inside joke between all of us. Well, when police pulled that video footage from the interior of the Walmart, they saw Kelly Ryan with a shopping cart full of seven canisters of lighter fluid and a barbecue set. Stop it. Because do people not realize that they're being recorded in public places? I mean, do they just throw caution to the wind and go, they might not think it's me? She did buy a barbecue set. That's weird. Why would she buy a barbecue set to make it look like she's buying the lighter fluid for the barbecue? Mm -hmm. Okay, because I really wondered about that. I was like, what were they doing with that? Then the exterior footage showed Craig stepping out of the couple's Jaguar to help Kelly load the lighter fluid into the back seat of the car. The footage was key for two reasons. First, because it destroyed Kelly and Craig's alibi. They had not been home on the night of December 13th when Melissa's body was burned. And second, because police believe that Craig opening the door to the backseat of the Jaguar was damning. Right, because when do you put the things that you went shopping for into the trunk of your car? Unless there was a body in the trunk. Good point. Police believe that Craig's actions were proof he knew Melissa James' body was in the trunk. But I mean... Let's say it was a small bag. Then maybe you would just put it in the back seat. I, we do that all the time. I get into the driver's seat and then put it into the back seat. But we're also not under the suspicion of killing someone. So I think that changes everything. At this point, the news of the police's investigation had started to filter into the bodybuilding community. Message boards were going crazy with discussions and people who knew Craig and Kelly weighed in. Some thought the couple was responsible. Others said that they would never do something like this. People presented their own wild theories about what happened to Melissa James. Of course they did. The armchair detectives, the online sleuths, they were in full swing. Meanwhile, the police obtained Melissa's phone from the motel room where she had been staying. There were a lot of romantic texts to her boyfriend, Brett, but there was also a text from Craig on December 12th, the night before her body was burned. And he said, quote, I wish you were here laying next to me. When are you going to get here? End quote. Craig had already confessed to his affair with Melissa, but the recency of this text proved that their affair had still been hot and heavy only a day before Melissa died. 
Evidence was mounting, but police were still searching for information that tied either Craig or Kelly to Melissa's death earlier in the day on December 13th. They felt pretty sure at this point that Craig and Kelly had disposed of Melissa's body, but had they killed her? And if so, where was the proof? I mean, it seems obvious to me because who else would be responsible? But I do understand they have to build a solid case. Right. Then on December 17th, Amanda Polk came forward. Amanda was a close friend and protege of Kelly's. She said that on the night of December 15th, Kelly and Craig had come over to the house she was renting with her boyfriend, Ryan Chastain. She said they appeared panicked. She said they told her and her boyfriend that they were in trouble. They mentioned that they might have to flee the country, go somewhere without extradition to the U.S. Amanda asked Kelly what had happened and Kelly broke down, crying and telling Amanda a horrifying story. She said that she found Melissa dead in their house off of an overdose. She said she had panicked, worried that there might be major reputational fallout if the media heard their personal assistant had overdosed in their house. She told Amanda that she and Craig had put Melissa's body into the trunk of their car and burned the car. Wow. I mean, it is plausible. That could happen. And they were celebrities, so I guess it would be a huge deal if someone OD'd in their house. Of course, when Amanda heard all this, though, she was shocked. And I just have to say, but would you go to that measure? Why wouldn't you just... Call 911. I mean, it's somebody, I don't know. It's very inhumane to even think that they would go that route. Yeah. Amanda was confused. She didn't understand why Kelly and Craig hadn't just called the police. That's what I was saying. Truly, if this was an accident, why not get help? And she also didn't understand why they were talking about fleeing the country, going on the run for illegal disposal of a body. I mean, sure, it is a crime that carries jail time, but the couple's entire life was there in the United States. Were they really going to throw all of that away over what they're calling a concealment of an overdose death? Once again, Kelly and Craig's story just wasn't adding up. And eventually, Amanda couldn't keep the story to herself any longer. She told the police everything that Kelly told her. Although there were still major gaps in the narrative with the information from Amanda Polk and Anthony Gross, Police finally felt they had enough to arrest Kelly and Craig. On December 20th, six days after Melissa's body was found, a judge issued arrest warrants for Kelly and Craig. On December 21st, police stormed their home, but it was too late. The house was in disarray. Kelly, Craig, and their pickup truck were gone. The couple had followed through on their plan, they told Amanda Polk. They were on the run. I want to note that I find this timeline a little confusing. Why did the police wait four days from Amanda Polk telling them that Kelly and Craig had threatened to leave the country to arrest the two of them? They had multiple people on record testifying to the couple's involvement in this illegal disposal of Melissa's body. And they might not have had any evidence that the couple killed her, but illegal disposal of a corpse and arson were certainly enough to bring them in. So I wondered if the couple's celebrity status could have had anything to do with that delay. Was the law enforcement hesitant to arrest such a well-known couple? Or maybe they were more concerned about the potential fallout if they were wrong. But then again, sometimes there's a lot of red tape and the process takes time to get arrest warrants issued. Maybe it still would have been too late because before police stormed their house, Craig and Kelly had been last seen on December 15th by Amanda Polk, who didn't report their plans to run away until two days later on the 17th. But maybe if the police had acted on their information immediately, there would have never been a need for a nationwide manhunt that ensued. As soon as Las Vegas police realized Craig and Kelly had fled, they contacted the FBI. The FBI sprung into action, determined to catch the couple before they left the country. A nationwide appeal was made. If anyone had any information about Kelly and Craig's whereabouts or the murder of Melissa James, they needed to come forward ASAP. This is when a guy named Jeff Schwimmer reached out to the police. Jeff was a retired wealthy businessman who had been friends with Craig and Kelly. He told the police that they had come by his house on the 15th looking for somewhere to hide out, but Jeff had been disturbed by what Craig said that night, so he didn't allow the couple to stay. Jeff said Craig told him he finally got to see what somebody looks like when you get hit by a taser gun. Craig said you should have seen this girl flop. Jeff said Craig seemed to think this whole situation was funny. If you remember back at the autopsy, one of Melissa's potential causes of death was electrocution by taser. This is the first piece of evidence that clearly linked Craig not to just the disposal of Melissa's body, but to the brutal attack that preceded it. 
That's actually morbid and disgusting, and it's heartless and cold-blooded. How could a man who had just been sleeping with this woman also say something like that? It's so callous. Like, you should have seen this girl flop. I finally got to see what it was like when you get tased. Yeah, that's disgusting. And Jeff also told police that Kelly had not liked Melissa at all. And I was thinking maybe Melissa was just Craig's play toy, and he didn't actually care about her because I think that's what it seems like to me. Right. Police theorized that Craig and Kelly likely moved onto Amanda Polk's house after Jeff's was a bust, eventually deciding to make a run for it when they realized they would not be able to hide in a friend's home. Yeah, and now they truly know who their friends are. Most of the people around them were most likely leeches, hoping to cash in for being close to celebrities. But then, the investigators finally received the proof they had been looking for, something that at last linked Craig and Kelly to Melissa's brutal killing. On December 22nd, unable to keep the horrible secret any longer, two of Craig and Kelly's best friends came forward. I guess they should be referred to as like so-called best friends. It was Jeremy and Megan Foley. Remember, you've heard their names before. This was the couple that Craig and Kelly said they partied with on the night of December 13th, the night that Melissa's body was burned. This couple was extremely close with Craig and Kelly. Kelly was even supposed to be a bridesmaid in Megan's upcoming wedding. But despite their close friendship, Megan and Jeremy felt they had to report what they knew. What they told police was extremely disturbing. They said that on the night of December 13th, when they hung out with Craig and Kelly at their house, the couple had told them a terrifying story. Kelly said that she confronted Melissa earlier that day about stealing from them, and a fight had broken out. Melissa had attempted to shoot Kelly with a taser. Kelly had managed to wrestle the taser away from Melissa, shooting her in the process, and Craig had walked in to find the two fighting, and he had intervened to save his wife's life. He overpowered Melissa by body slamming her and choking her with his bicep. Then Craig held Melissa down while Kelly injected her with drugs. Megan said at this point in the storytelling that Craig had actually wrapped his bicep around her neck to demonstrate the stranglehold that he used on Melissa. Craig said, it's really funny. If you want to know how you can kill someone by choking them, I can show you. And just like Jeff Schwimmer had said, Craig seemed to find this entire situation hilarious. And I find it to be disgusting. It makes me sick to think about. And Megan was terrified. She said that she and Jeremy tried to get out of there as fast as they could. But before they left, Craig and Kelly gave their friends a duffel bag and asked them to hold on to it. On December 22nd, a week after Kelly and Craig had entrusted them with this bag, Megan and Jeremy finally handed it over to police. Who would hold on to a random duffel bag after hearing a story like that is beyond me. None of us would because we consume so much true crime. We know. When police looked inside the bag, they were shocked by what they found. Inside was a roll of duct tape, a nightstick, and a taser. Well, at least it wasn't body parts because that's what I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I don't understand why they didn't destroy the bag. There was blood-like substance on the tip and on the handle of the nightstick, so it was swapped for DNA analysis. Plus, when investigators sent the taser back to the manufacturer, the company was able to determine that the taser had been fired six times in a two-minute time frame between 2.10 and 2.12 p.m. on December 13th, 2005. A taser gun also releases paper circles when it fires. And when the officers combed the couple's house for these paper discharges, they found some on the floor and in the vacuum. Wow. So someone tried to do a little cleanup afterward. And also, I don't know if y'all know this, but I learned that some tasers, more professional ones that the police use actually have video on them. So when they are engaged, they begin recording everything, kind of like a body cam. Now this taser didn't have that, but I do think that that could really come in handy for investigators. I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. At this point, the evidence in the duffel bag, plus Megan and Jeremy's statements, only increased law enforcement's urgency to find the couple. Here finally was proof that not only Craig and Kelly callously disposed of Melissa's body as if she were trash, not the assistant that they had known and loved for years, but they had actually brought about her death in a brutal, concerted attack, even attempting to cover their tracks by injecting her with drugs. 
Suddenly, their emphasis on Melissa's drug use when they spoke to the police made so much sense. It was all part of their plan, part of their story if anyone even started to get close to the truth. I hate when people lie about deceased individuals and then they like shit talk them, especially when they're the ones who murdered them. That's just cold. Yeah. Meanwhile, the FBI had received a tip that Kelly and Craig planned to meet a friend in Boston, someone who could help them fake some passports. They were really trying to get away with this. Damn. It reminds me of a case I did on my main channel. One of the most disturbing and brutal cases I've ever covered. It was a thrill kill case. I'll link it in the cards and below in case you want to watch something with similar undertones. But in this case, the couple apparently planned to go to Greece, a country with no extradition to the U.S. Now, Scott Bakken, an FBI special agent, said they teamed up with Boston police to track the couple down. They quickly found the couple's truck abandoned at Logan International Airport. And clearly, Craig and Kelly had swapped out their easily identifiable vehicle for another. But although the couple had switched out their car, they didn't stop using their cell phones. Nine days after Melissa's murder, Kelly and Craig were finally found in Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. And you won't believe what they were doing when they got caught. Kelly was arrested by an entire SWAT team in a salon getting a pedicure. Craig was waiting for his in his new car outside, sipping on a root beer. Seriously? They're trying to escape the country and Kelly stops for a quick pedicure and he's waiting to get his toes done too? Ugh, I guess old habits die hard. This couple's entire life had been centered around their appearance. They always had to be picture perfect, even on the run from the FBI. Kelly couldn't stand not to be well manicured, and eventually it costed her her freedom. When Craig and Kelly were arrested, they had $8,300 in cash on them. And later, Titus's attorney would deny that the couple had any plans to flee the country, yeah, right. saying that they were vacationing in Massachusetts and had no idea there was an arrest warrant out for them. Really? Then why did you switch out your car? Why did you drive from Vegas to Boston? Why wouldn't you just fly? And why did they have close to $10,000 in cash on them? The idea that Kelly and Craig did not know that the FBI was hunting them when it was a headline across the news is just ridiculous. But but it's just a small taste of the many attempts that Kelly and Craig will make after their arrest to deny culpability. Right. And after they were arrested, the pair told officers yet another version of Melissa's death. Oh my gosh. Before we get into this latest lie, let's tally up all the different stories we've heard so far. First, they told police they fired Melissa. She left. They went to sleep. Melissa came back, stole their car. They never saw her again. Then we have the story from Anthony Gross. They just needed a friend to help burn the car in the middle of the night. Third is the account from Amanda Polk. Melissa overdosed and they burned the body in a panic about bad publicity. Then what the Foley said that Craig and Kelly admitted to a violent physical altercation with Melissa that resulted in her death, followed by them burning her body. At this point, the couple has woven such a tangled web of different stories, and it's honestly astounding. It made this case really difficult to research, trying to keep track of all the different versions of the story, what they told to whom and when. I can't even imagine how Craig and Kelly kept it all together. And I'm sure law enforcement was even more frustrated. In Kelly and Craig's latest story, Story, they told police that they had found Melissa James dead off of an overdose in their car while the Foley's were at their house. They told officers to check with the Foley's that their friends would confirm their story. Little did they know, their so-called best friends who they expected to corroborate their lie had already sold them out and in fact had handed over the most crucial evidence against them. Craig said that when he found Melissa, he brought her into the living room and tenderly laid her down on a blanket. Then, because he loved her so much, he couldn't bear to look at her like that. So, he covered her face with duct tape before putting her in the trunk of his car and burning her body. Yeah, I don't believe that for a second. It's pretty disgusting that he like, oh, I loved her so much. I didn't want to. So, I wrapped duct tape around her face. Like, that's, that's, no, you don't do that. To think that anyone, let alone a seasoned police officer, would even believe a story like this is the height of arrogance. Investigators also mentioned that Craig repeatedly referred to them as bro and pal. Hey, bro, you know, here's a story. I laid her tenderly on a blanket and put duct tape around her face. 
because I loved her so much. Anyway, he would compliment the police officers all the time. He really thought that he could charm his way out of this. He was so used to everyone around him idolizing him that he forgot the law doesn't make exceptions for celebrities, but don't they? I mean, they sometimes do. O.J. Simpson, I'm going to leave that there. But anyway, the fact that he said that he loved Melissa really bothered me and how he acted like he was being kind and gentle because it couldn't be further from the truth. Craig would eventually change the story one final time, fixing on the following version of events leading up to his trial. This version was similar to the story he told the Foley's, but with several key differences. He said he walked in on Melissa and Kelly fighting, but this time he played up his fear for his wife. He said there were taser darts in Kelly's leg and blood on her face and shirt. He also played up Melissa's aggression, saying she jumped on him and hit him in the head with a taser gun. He said he grabbed her by the neck to subdue her and was yelling at her to stop and calm down. Finally, he let go of Melissa. He said at this point she was still alive, but she stumbled off to her room. 40 minutes later, when Kelly and Craig checked on her, she was dead off of an overdose. He said the three of them had spent the days leading up to the fight getting high on cocaine, painkillers, and crystal meth, and that Melissa had just finally reached her limit and overdosed. He said everything he and Kelly had done in the aftermath of her death was the result of fear and because they were high on drugs. Interesting that now that he was caught, all of his bravado was gone. All of his jokes about watching Melissa flop when the taser hit her, his proud demonstrations of how to choke someone with your bicep, that all disappeared from his story. Also interesting that the only elements of his story that changed from the version he told the Follies were the ones that implicated him directly in Melissa's death. Melissa James's body was finally formally identified after Craig and Kelly were arrested on January 18th, 2006. It took almost a month after her body was found to confirm her identity. They were also able to confirm through forensic analysis Melissa's DNA was on the tip of the nightstick and Craig's DNA was found on the handle, helping them link him definitively to a physical altercation with Melissa. I know we've talked a lot about the many lies of Craig and Kelly, but I don't want us to lose focus on what really matters, Melissa. They so brutally destroyed her life and her body that it took weeks for authorities to identify her. Just think about that. Weeks. Her family had to wait for final confirmation of the horrible news they already knew. Weeks that they had to wait before they laid her to rest. Melissa James was finally buried in Mount Hope Cemetery in Lynn Haven Bay in Florida, where she had grown up, gone to school, and even run her dance studio. In March 2006, a jury jointly indicted Craig and Kelly for kidnap, arson, use of a deadly weapon, and the murder of Melissa James. When the two appeared in court for the first time, they both looked very different from their cover star selves. Each of them was dressed in a drab blue prison uniform, and Kelly had dyed her platinum blonde hair brown and was wearing glasses. And Craig shouted at Kelly from across the courtroom, don't say nothing. It's really laughable to me when defendants try to dress up like differently. If you've watched the Jody Arias trial, that's one of them. Like her blonde hair went brown. She put the glasses on. I wonder if the jury buys that. But then again, it's like it, if they don't know about the case, they might not know what they looked like before, but then they're going to see photos of them anyway. Despite all the evidence against Craig and Kelly, the two pled not guilty. They filed for joint defense, and after several lawyer changes, they ended up being represented by the same law firm. Leading up to the trial, each defendant made several unsuccessful attempts to have the charges dismissed completely. Despite this, Kelly and Craig's defense team remained confident. They said it wasn't even clear whether Melissa had been murdered, basing their defense heavily on the medical examiner's inconclusive cause of death. Remember, Melissa's body was so severely burned that while the medical examiner was able to identify several potential causes of death, he could not formally classify the death as a homicide. The prosecution said this was ludicrous. They aimed to prove that Craig and Kelly's actions reflected calculated, planned effort, not the behavior of someone panicking. They said there was ample evidence not only that the pair had killed Melissa, but they tried to clean up and cover up afterward. Finally, they planned to focus heavily on the nightstick, a weapon which did not appear in any version of Craig or Kelly's stories, but provided the clearest forensic proof of a physical altercation. Leading up to the trial, court documents show Craig and Kelly's defense lawyers battling to keep the evidence out of the proceedings. 
For example, they wanted to exclude Craig's steroid use and the mention of roid rage. They also wanted to exclude one particular anecdote. Remember Craig's daughter from his first marriage, the one he never really mentions. Well, one witness wanted to testify to a story Craig had told in which he picked his teenage daughter up by her neck and threw her across the room because she was wearing an outfit he deemed as inappropriate. In the end, the judge decided that this story was more prejudicial than probative. I disagree. I think that this detail is highly relevant. To me, it speaks to the callous disregard for women and the dangerous history of domestic altercations that makes Craig's murder of Melissa seem not only possible, but likely. But I am not the judge. Craig and Melissa waited for their trial in Clark County Correctional Facility in Vegas. Their attempt to leave the country had classified them as an extreme flight risk. So they were denied bail. Craig was kept in isolation for most of his time in Clark County facility because of his celebrity status. Even from jail, though, Craig kept trying to spin the story in his favor. He told the Review Journal, quote, Kelly and I loved Melissa. She was our friend. She was our family. She was one of my best friends, end quote. He told the Reno Gazette Journal, quote, my wife and I are caring people. We are loving people. We are not the horrific monsters we've been portrayed as, end quote. He also wrote a letter to Dan Solomon, a host on the pro bodybuilding wheelie radio show, claiming he was 100% innocent and promising that after he and Kelly were acquitted on all charges, he was going to write a book titled Titus tells all, detailing his side of the story. I'll say it again. Craig's assertions of his innocence and his love for Melissa are disgusting, but not unexpected from a man who had consistently tried to reshape the narrative to make himself look better. But then something truly unexpected happened. Officers discovered a murder for hire plot to eliminate the three key witnesses against Craig and Kelly, Anthony Gross, Megan Folly, and Jeremy Folly. Yep, a police informant from the Clark County Correctional Facility named Dean Kassam came forward and told law enforcement that he had heard two fellow inmates, Craig Titus and 34-year-old Nelson Bradley, plotting to hire a hitman to take out the problematic witnesses. Are you kidding me? And the two had been incarcerated together briefly in Clark County Correctional Facility back in February 2006. Investigators sprang into action, attempting to confirm Kasim's allegations. They caught Nelson Brady quickly. He paid an undercover hitman $1,500 as a down payment to take out the Follies and Anthony Gross on Craig's behalf. Wow. It's like, I want to say I can't believe it, but I actually can because nothing surprises me anymore. Not in Vegas. On October 21st, 2006, Nelson Brady was arrested and charged with three counts of solicitation to commit murder. He would later be found guilty on all charges in February 2008. However, police had more difficulty proving Craig's involvement. Police believed Craig and Brady had been using a code to discuss the hits, pretending instead to be talking about a book Craig wanted to publish. In a recorded phone conversation, Brady told Craig that he had been on the internet searching for which characters were going to be in the book. Brady then said he knew how to keep those characters from being in the book. Titus replied, yeah, no shit, yeah, from the screenplay? While this conversation definitely seemed unusual, it wasn't enough to convict Craig, so police struck the deal with Anthony Gross in exchange for a reduced sentence to help him test Craig. They created a false crime scene in which Anthony Gross pretended to be dead. They sent a photo of Anthony's pretend dead body to Craig masquerading as the hitman and requesting final payment. That's pretty extreme. It really is. And I like it. But Craig did not take the bait. He merely sent the pictures to his lawyer and denied any involvement and knowledge in this plot. In the end, police did not bring any charges against Craig. Yeah, this is just a crazy part of the entire story. And on one hand, I do think Craig seems stupid, reckless, and arrogant enough to do something like this. And I think he could think he could get away with it. But on the other hand, if the police didn't charge him, they must have had a good reason. They must have thought he truly wasn't involved. Nelson Brady was apparently a big fan of Craig's. So maybe he did this on his own volition. But either way, the lead up to Craig and Kelly's trial was full of drama. While the entire murder for hire investigation was unfolding, there was also reports of someone trying to shop a sex tape featuring Craig, Kelly, and Melissa. But the tape apparently never surfaced, thankfully. That's just terrible. Finally, more than two years after Melissa's death, May 2008 arrived, and Craig and Kelly's trial was set to begin. 
However, to everyone's shock, on May 30th, 2008, the couple amended their plea and pled guilty, each taking their own plea deal. In her plea, Kelly, who is now 35, took responsibility for having a fight with Melissa and pled guilty to assault with a deadly weapon and arson, receiving a 6 to 26 year prison sentence. While Kelly took a standard guilty plea for arson, she took an Alford plea for the charge of assault with a deadly weapon. This means that Kelly does not admit guilt to the charge, but she acknowledged that there was enough evidence to convict her on the count. When Kelly took the stand, she said, quote, for the past two years and seven months through prayer, soul searching, and many hours of reflection, I've questioned my own actions and my very soul. I'm truly, truly sorry for this. I ask for forgiveness from both this court and Melissa's family. I take responsibility for what I did, end quote. If Kelly was directly involved in Melissa's murder, six to 26 years is a shockingly light sentence in my opinion, but detectives admitted that they didn't have the same type of evidence linking Kelly physically to the act of murder. They could only tie her to the disposal of the body, the cover-up, and fleeing authorities. Craig was a different case. In his plea, Craig, now 43, took responsibility for Melissa's death, pleading guilty to kidnapping, second-degree murder, and arson, receiving a prison sentence of 21 to 51 years in prison. However, despite his guilty plea, Craig was still trying to spin the story. He said he only took the guilty plea out of loyalty to his wife. He said, quote, I admitted to something that did not happen so that my wife could go home, end quote. On the stand, he said, quote, I am ashamed. I am sickened at my actions after Melissa passed away. It was all drug-induced. It was all ridiculous. I am so sorry this happened, end quote. Notice how he said passed away and not murdered. Oh my gosh, this man just will not quit at every step in this entire case from the moment he killed Melissa all the way through his plea deal. He refused to take accountability for his actions. And I have heard this from other defendants. They'll do this to minimize what they did. They'll say like passed on, passed away, got hurt. It's like, no, they were murdered. Judge Glass, the presiding judge on Kelly and Craig's case, called the tears that Craig and Kelly cried while making their statements to the court crocodile tears. She didn't buy their remorse. And Mara James, Melissa's mom, wasn't happy either. She took the stand to make a victim impact statement and said, quote, from the moment Melissa failed to arrive on her flight on November 13, 2005, Craig Titus told the kind of lies that pierced a mother's soul. As long as I live, I will never hear her voice, never see her face, never experience the joy of seeing her married, nor see the birth of her first child. All of the passages of Melissa's life are forever halted because Craig Titus and Kelly Ryan said so. They doused my daughter with lighter fluid like some piece of trash. Did they imagine that the flames would eat away 70% of her body, that this once beautiful 115 pound woman would become 103 pounds of blackened flesh and crumbling bone? End quote. Sadly, Mara James would receive no relief from Anthony Gross's sentence either. On May 5th, 2009, almost a year after Kelly and Craig took their plea deals, Anthony received probation for his involvement. His light sentence was partially due to his cooperation in the murder for hire case, as well as his young age. Lawyers painted him as a starstruck kid. Anthony said, quote, I live with regret for answering the phone that night. I thought I was helping someone, but I realized I wasn't helping, end quote. Mora doesn't agree with the defense that Anthony deserved a second chance because he was young. She said Melissa was young and she had no second chance, at least in part because of Anthony's actions. What are your thoughts? I like hearing them in the comments. Also in 2009, Kelly divorced Craig Titus from prison. Now this divorce and Kelly's impending release from prison on parole changed Craig's tune a little bit. Craig actually wrote to Melissa McCarty, who was a reporter from Crime Watch. He wrote her letters from jail. And in these letters, he claimed that he only received such a harsh sentence because his fame as a bodybuilder. He said in the letter that he'd taken no part in the murder. He wrote, quote, I wasn't even present when Melissa died in my home. The women were together after the fight. I was gone. I signed a deal I never should have signed. Never, end quote. Craig's mother appeared on Crime Watch backing him up, saying Kelly was a real murderer and that if she were truly a Christian, as she claimed, she would come forward and tell the truth. She called her son a good boy with a heart of gold. 
Seriously? Ugh, at least we now know where some of Craig's audacity and delusion comes from, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. Although Mara James reached out to the Nevada Department of Corrections with a picture of her daughter, Melissa, each time Kelly was up for parole, eventually in October 2017, Kelly was released. She spent less than nine years in prison. Wow. wow. That's actually pretty unbelievable to me. And this poor mother has tried to heal after the loss of her daughter. She said she tries to focus on the fun that she had with Melissa, the good memories that they shared. She says she takes heart in the fact that she knows she'll see Melissa again one day. But despite her attempts to heal and move on, she's haunted by Craig Titus's refusal to take responsibility for his actions. She said that Craig Titus will never have anything to say that I want to hear unless he accepts responsibility and is truly remorseful for brutally killing Melissa. After everything he did, it feels like the bare minimum he could offer a grieving mother. But I think this is the crux of this case, Craig Titus's arrogance and entitlement. For his entire life, he was surrounded by people who idolized him, praised him, thought he could do no wrong, so much so that he began to believe it himself. He thought he was above reproach, above the law, above such petty things as consequences. He took Melissa's life because he felt entitled to it, just like he felt entitled to everything. Craig Titus is currently imprisoned at Lovelock Correctional Center, just outside of Reno, Nevada. He is scheduled to be released on May 11th, 2033 when he is almost 70 years old. That's a long time behind bars, but it's not long enough in my opinion. My dad just turned 70. 70 is really not that old. I mean, he could still live a really good life after he gets out. And I think that is entirely unfair. Craig may have as many as 30 years of freedom after his release. Melissa was barely past 30 when she was killed, when he killed her. Because of Craig and Kelly, Melissa James's life is now over. But I try to take comfort in the fact that her memory will live on and that she will be remembered for her kindness, her beauty, her ambition, her spirit, and her love of dance. Whereas Craig and Kelly, on the other hand, will only be remembered as one former bodybuilder named Sean Ray put it as killers, not even a footnote in bodybuilding. I mean, at least in this case, it goes to show that just because you are a celebrity or you are famous doesn't mean you're going to get away with things. We're seeing this a lot lately, like with that guy from TikTok who killed his wife. And it's like, oh, I'm famous on TikTok. It's like, it doesn't mean anything. You go to the bathroom just like everybody else. Like always, thank you all so very much for being with us today. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye.